As an enthusiast, I'm very excited about what Skylake brings to the table, and we might finally have a processor and platform that gets users of the Core i7-920 and the i7-2600K to upgrade. Hey everybody, welcome to PC Perspective. I'm Ryan Shrout. Today we're here to talk to you about the brand new Intel Core i7-6700K. This is the first processor in Intel's Skylake family of CPUs to be released. Uh, this is a mainstream enthusiast class level product, not an E-series part. So it's gonna be $350 price tag, quad-core processors, you know, not going to six and eight core there. Uh, let's talk a little bit about specifications of what the 6700K is and what Skylake is. First of all, as I mentioned, it is a quad-core hyper-threaded part although they are releasing a Core i5-6600K today as well that is a quad-core non-hyper-threaded part. Those are the only two actual processors being announced and released today. You have a base clock speed of 4 GHz, so the same as the Devil's Canyon CPU that was released not too long ago, and a 4.2 GHz maximum turbo frequency. So you actually have a very limited range of where the frequency will scale to, but those frequencies are pretty high, so I think we'll, we'll take what we can get there. Also, this is a move from DDR3 to DDR4 memory. Even though the architecture technically supports both, I think you'll only see DDR3 on kind of tablets and low-cost platforms. DDR4 is what you're gonna see here in our enthusiast and desktop SKUs. So that means uh, we're gone are the days with DDR3. We'll have DDR4 starting at around 2133 megahertz. We've already seen kits from Corsair and G-Skill come into our office that are quoting you know, 3400 megahertz uh, speeds there. So there's a lot of improvement will happen on the memory side space. You have updated graphics support as well. So you have Intel HD 530 is the new brand for that graphics, which will have some amount of uh, improved graphics and, and more, uh, higher count of execution units. Uh, it performance wise is 30 to 50% faster than Haswell. So that's interesting. But again, on kind of an enthusiast class platform like this, chances are you're going to be using a discrete graphics card. So it doesn't matter quite as much. It is a 14 nanometer design and it is a totally new CPU architecture. But interestingly, other than that, I really can't tell you much about it. Intel's kind of going in reverse this time where they're releasing a couple of these parts starting with the enthusiasts, which is nice, uh, but without revealing the full details about the Skylake architecture itself. Uh, we expect that to happen in the next week or two at IDF, but usually we get this reverse. We get the architecture announcement, and then maybe a couple of months later, we actually get the processor release here. So we'll, we'll learn more about that, and we'll tell you about more architectural details, if you will, there. There's only one thing that I note that changed is that the integrated voltage regulator, the Fiverr is what it was called, uh, has been removed from Skylake. It was in Haswell, it was in Broadwell, due to some uh, efficiency issues at the low end of the scale. They basically just decided to scrap the whole thing, so now board power is back in control of uh, delivery into the CPU. So what do you get with this over Haswell, over over Sandy Bridge, over Ivy Bridge, anything that's come before it, uh, performance-wise, you're looking at a modest 5 to 10% performance improvement over Haswell. I know it's kind of getting old and getting tired of saying those types of things. We've seen that from Sandy to Ivy, from Ivy to Haswell, and so forth. Um, but you really are, we're seeing limits of IPC improvements in this case. What's interesting is in our testing, I went back and tested Sandy Bridge, Ivy Bridge, Haswell, Broadwell, Skylake, all at the same frequency, just to see how those clock speeds, or how that IPC has increased with a static flat clock speed. As it turns out, you're looking anywhere from 20 to 25% improvement from somebody who's on a Sandy Bridge platform today if you went up to a Skylake platform today. And that actually doesn't count frequencies. The Skylake processor frequencies are generally pretty high, especially out of the box, com box compared to where Sandy Bridge was at. Um, if you look at benchmarks, if we look at raw synthetics or CPU-based benchmarks, again, you're looking at anywhere from 5 to 12% improvements of the Core i7-6700K over the Core i7-4700K. 4790K. That happens in Sandra, 
uh, which is obviously a synthetic test, but it also happens in things like Cinebench 11 and Pavre, which are rendering-based applications, but in our X264 benchmarks, we see that as well. So there are some noticeable performance gains, nothing earth-shattering, but I think enough that users of Sandy Bridge and Ivy Bridge, at the least, will find the desire to upgrade finally be there. If you're on a Haswell platform, probably really not, uh, not worth jumping into yet. The uh, interesting thing here, if we look at overclocking, uh, Overclocking is very similar. There's a couple of changes. Again, with no integrated voltage regulator, you control the voltage directly on the motherboard, but your interface for that is essentially the same. I was able to get 4.7 gigahertz on our particular sample on all cores full, uh, full time. So that's anywhere from a 500 to 700 megahertz increase in performance, uh, depending on how you measure it. And it was completely stable at about 1.4 volts, temperatures ranging at about 85 C with a 240 millimeter Corsair all-in-one cooler uh, radiator kind of powering all of it. Um, let's talk pricing, 350 bucks. That's what Intel is asking for the Core i7-6700K. That is pretty much right in line with where they released the 4790K, where they released the 4770K, where the 3770K came out. And I actually think that's uh, a fairly aggressive price point. Um, there were rumors of it being, you know, 315, and it may get to that over time with, with some price drops. But at $350, I still think it is a very competitive part. I think, uh, the upgrade cost is going to be a little bit more. You still have to buy a new motherboard. It is a Z170 chipset. Obviously, it had to do that in order to add support for DDR4 memory, which is going to cost you a little bit more there. If you're hoping to take your DDR3 with you, you won't be able to do that in this instance. The, the, there are some other changes to this that I, I think we, we want to touch on. One is the Z170 chipset. We're going to have another video and a story talking about what changes the Z170 chipset brings to the table. This here is the Asus Z170 Deluxe. It has a lot of great options on there. Storage options, wireless options, tons of USB 3.1. And a lot of that capability comes from some of the changes that Intel has made in Z170 uh, in terms of the interface between the CPU and the chipset, as well as how many PCI Express lanes the chipset actually has access to directly. So take a look out for that. And also, we're doing another story. I know we're, we're inundating you with uh, Skylake stories today. Another story that really looks at how discrete gaming works on the Skylake processor versus, say, the Sandy Bridge. I know that we have a ton of readers, a ton of viewers that are probably still on an Ahalem processor or a Sandy Bridge processor, and maybe you're curious, is it finally time to do that upgrade? Is it finally time to spend the money and invest if you are a PC gamer? I think we'll have a, a pretty interesting answer for you there. Make sure you go to PCPar.com, guys. We have a full review. Uh, with all the benchmarks and other data that you may want on the Core i7-6700K Skylake processor. And uh, we'll see you next time, guys. Thanks.